plays out for Jonathan Taylor and the Colts. Frank Reich's former team, they face the Titans this week. The Panthers face the Bucks without Frank Reich, who for the second consecutive year, as we spoke about on the show yesterday, is fired mid-season, a 1-10 start in Carolina. Chris Tabor taking over as the interim head coach. There were additional changes in terms of Josh McCown, the quarterback's coach, running back's coach, Deuce Staley also out. Thomas Brown, Jim Caldwell taking over the offense. Here's what David Tepper had to say about a variety of things a short time ago. I do have patience. I'm just not (laughs) – my reputation away from this game is one for extreme patience. You know, there's no reason why that doesn't, you know, come here too. It does. Now, that patience comes with good performance and things that you want to see progress be made in different aspects. Um, And as, you know, as I said, you know, I would like to have somebody here for 20, 30 years. I'd like to have somebody (laughs) that would say eulogy at my funeral in 30 years. Okay, maybe it's 40 years, I hope. But uh, that's what I'd like to have. A little dark right there from David Tepper. But I think the point is he'd like to find the coach, have them for a long time, like so many other people that he's had in a variety of different business enterprises over the years. We welcome in our friend Cameron Wolf to the conversation as well. Judy, I want to start with you. You've covered a lot of different coaching changes, a lot of different owners through the years. When you hear David Tepper's words that he said about a lot of different things during a relatively short press conference today. What are your primary takeaways? Well, I wanted to hear a whole lot. First of all, I wanted to hear a whole lot more detail about everything, but I really wanted to hear a whole lot more about uh, what he said about self-reflection, doing some self-reflection when he was asked, um, might you consider changes to the way you're going to conduct this coaching search and might you consider changes to the way you run the day-to-day business at the organization. Clearly something is not translating because he went back over and over to the fact that he's really patient in his hedge fund business. And my favorite quote from the entire day was, no one ever leaves me, right? He's got employees who are there for decades and decades in his other business. Something is not working here. He didn't really get into what does he think he has done wrong in the hiring process with Matt Rule and then Frank Reich, because the fact of the matter is he has hired these guys and then decided very quickly in the scheme of the NFL that they are not the right fit. So something is not right here in the hiring process. And keep in mind, before David Tepper bought the Carolina Panthers, he was a minority owner for the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is the exact opposite of how he is conducting business at the Carolina Panthers. They are an incredibly patient organization. They hire coaches. They don't meddle very often. They leave them alone, and they get great results. Clearly, David Tepper is frustrated, but I I really wanted to hear much more about how he might have to change to get better results. Judy, I love what you said there. This is the sixth head coach David Tepper will have since 2018, including interims. And I talked to a couple of people in that Panthers building, and one text I got back was it was a matter of time for Frank Reich. It was 11 games, but it felt like a matter of time. Frank Reich had been telling his assistant for weeks that he was fearful of getting fired. The energy in the building was representative of that as well. And there's a couple of things I want to focus on here. It all stemmed off of Bryce Young, not looking like the quarterback so far in his career that they drafted number one overall. David Tepper said today, hey, through all the speculation, did they all want Bryce? Did he have an influence? He said, no, I made the last decision. It was unanimous. The reality is Bryce is not playing to the level that he should be playing. And David Tepper believes it's the coach, not the quarterback, as the reason. And you look at some of the elements of the Panthers offense, their bottom five and uh, the amount of pre-snap motion they're running, the play action they're running. They don't run RPOs. These are all things that the Panthers organization feel like they should have more of. But Frank Reich's offense just does not believe in a lot of these elements. And so when you look at the Panthers going forward, I think you'll see them try to look for a new age coach that has a lot of those uh, temp poles of, of philosophy for Bryce Young. The second part I want to focus on, this Carolina Panthers team is in a, in a state of transition. I talked to another uh, assistant from a different team who said this is the worst roster in football. They're going to try to fire, try to hire a coach without a first round pick. And uh, this is a spot where the Panthers were in just last year. And so a lot of coaches are uprooted. They're going to have to try to find the right guy for Bryce Young. But there's not a lot of answers in David Tepper's press conference. And there's not a lot of answers for the Panthers organization as they move forward right now. Well, th- listen, uh, David Tepper's uh, attempt to say that he wants somebody to be there for 40 years moving forward. Um, 
is certainly his way of setting the table, Cam, for this upcoming coaching search because uh, Steve Weish and James Palmer was on with them in the NFL report yesterday. And Weish made a pretty good point to me. He said, you know, why would this be considered a good job? And I said, well, there's a few reasons, one of which we've seen before. A lot of times when an owner, bang, bang, fires guys back to back, he wants to make sure that the next guy has a long runway uh, to establish what he's trying to do. So I-, I would say that that's potentially one here. You get a guy that wants to show that he's got patience. Now, he also made it clear that you're going to have to be successful uh, when you come in there. Uh, so I do expect that this is still going to be a job. There's only 32 of them. We say it every year. There's only 32 of them. I still expect that this is going to be a job uh, that is going to be sought after, uh, certainly by a number of candidates, if not all candidates. We'll see about that as we get closer uh, to the uh, hiring process in January and potentially into February with how they're delaying the process these days. But I digress. Uh, And, Tom, before I throw it back to you, we should address the fact that David Tepper said uh, they thought they were going to get C.J. Stroud because they thought they were going to go on up to number two, and they thought the Texans or whoever would take some uh, uh, Bryce Young at one. He said, once we got to one, everybody was bought in on on Young. They are still behind Bryce Young. Was everybody in on it the entire time? Eh, I don't know about that, but they are still confident in Bryce Young. Bottom line, they got to a consensus at the end, which is what you have to do. It's not as if somebody's going to storm out of the building if they took Bryce Young. And I would tell you Mm -hmm. this, I do a ton of work on the quarterbacks, not watching film, but talking to people with all the different teams, GMs and scouts and coaches, And there was a league-wide consensus, not unanimous, but the consensus was Bryce Young was the top quarterback. I thought the most important thing, and Cameron referenced it there, that David Tepper said in the entire press conference, certainly the most specific thing he said was he was on his way off the podium. Somebody managed to get him to stay for one more question. It was about, was everybody on board on this pick? Tepper said, among other things, we are totally confident in that Mm -hmm. pick. The subtext of saying that is we still don't feel like we picked the wrong quarterback I feel yeah. like I picked the wrong coach for him. So as you move forward now into this process, the focus is going to really be what it started out last year for the Panthers, which is get that coach, as Cameron said, probably a young, innovative type of an offensive mind to grow with your young quarterback. These next six weeks right now are about stripping it down in terms of the voices in Bryce Young's head trying to salvage something from a rookie season that has been frustrating for absolutely everyone. Carolina does not have their number one pick. That belongs to the Bears as part of the trade that got him Bryce Young. And here was Chicago last night taking on the Vikings. You didn't see it enough last night. Let's show you some more right here. Josh Dobbs back to earth for the pastor not. There's a pick for Jalen Johnson. And you get a pick, Jaquan Brisker. And you get a pick, TJ Edwards. First career three interception game for Josh Dobbs. He was not done. Here it is, fourth quarter now. Vikings trailing 9-3. Heavy pressure on Dobbs. This ball's tick. Kyler Gordon make it four interceptions for Dobbs on the night. Ensuing Bears drive, though. The Vikings defense played outstanding through the course of this game. The Neil Hunter has been a one-man wrecking crew. Does it again right here, getting the strip. It's his teammate, Sheldon Day, that falls on the football. Take a one more look at this. Again, Hunter making himself a lot of money. Contract year, no franchise tag. It'll be a big one come March. Vikings get the ball back. This is their best drive by far. Dobbs, TJ Hawkinson, touchdown just like that. Vikings up 10-9. to Late fourth quarter now. Minute six to go. Justin Fields trying to answer with a drive, and he did. TJ Moore popping free down the middle of the field. This is a 36-yard gain for DJ Moore right here. Gets him into position for the true star of the game, Cairo Santos. 13 seconds to go. It's a 30-yard field goal. And Cairo Santos, as he did four times last night, delivered. This one wasn't a real high degree of difficulty. 12-10, Bears win. Matt Eberflus gets his first win against an NFC North opponent. As we welcome in, somebody knows a lot about the Bears. Stacey Dales there in Chicago, along with our Brian Baldinger. Baldy, this was a game where I think you saw... Josh Dobbs maybe regressing to the mean a little bit in this Vikings offense. That Bears defense also looks like they're playing a lot better since the Montez Sweat trade. Break this one down. What did you see in this game? Well, um, as opposed to a popular opinion that was started with the show that it was not a great game last night, I had a blast breaking this game down this morning <laughs> and really analyzing it because it's Brian Flores, it's Flores against Flus, and both of them have massively improved defenses. And so I watched this last time go, where's Justin Fields supposed to go with the ball a lot of times? 
And same thing with Josh Dobbs. Like, they're taking the downfield throws away. Meanwhile, both pass rushes have infinitely improved. Jalen Johnson might have played his best game I've ever seen him play. And the rookie on the other side, Terrell Smith, played excellent as well. And so I feel like both these defenses have improved to the point where I don't care who they play. It's going to be tough to really get chunk yards and big plays. And it really came down to the final drive. And really, Justin Fields, for as much as he struggled against a very good Viking defense, he made two great throws to D.J. Moore to put him in a position to win the game with a field goal. So, I don't know. I thought it was classic black and blue division football going back to when it was the black and blue division. Wait a minute, Baldy. Are you saying that that was pleasurable to watch last night? Yes. Is that what you're very actually much. saying? <laughs> I'm saying that and pleasurable to, to really break down and analyze. There was a lot there, yeah. Stacey. Well, I bet uh, I know Brian Flores is... But, Baldy, can we both agree on something here, that Brian Flores went to bed with nightmares uh, last night for not blitzing on that final throw uh, against Justin Fields? Yeah. I mean, they were daring him to play quarterback, right? They, uh, they, they rushed three, and uh, they just played a deep zone right there, and Justin Fields might have made the best throw, Stacey, he's made all year to D.J. Moore. To put yeah, field yeah. well, so I t my takeaways from this game, you know, obviously Minnesota is still in the playoff hunt at six and six now. That really hurt them to lose against the Chicago Bears. I really did feel, though, Baldy and, and company that the Bears should have won given all the turnovers. And I guess in my conversations with people here in Chicago and some of my buddies who cover these Bears often is the silver lining is Justin Fields did overcome those two fumbles to finish a game. I thought he played better actually uh, last week against the Detroit Lions. I thought he was extraordinary with the exception of their meltdown in the fourth quarter. And so their big focus this week, the Bears, was to finish a game. And they did that, albeit not even registering a touchdown in this game. Uh, the other silver lining, of course, for the Bears is, is they have eight takeaways in their last two games. So, you know, a, a big tip of the cap to Matt Eberflus, who to, had to take over those defensive play calling duties uh, for the Bears when Allen Williams left, and they've just gotten better and better. The run game defensively is better, and eight takeaway, takeaways over the last two games is substantial. But if you're the Vikings, I'm looking at their schedule, guys. They're on the bye right now. They come out of the bye. They're at Vegas. They're at the Bengals. So those are two games they could potentially compete in and win, but they've got to finish in their division against Detroit, Green Bay, and Detroit again. So it's going to be interesting to see, you guys, how this NFC North race shakes out especially given how Detroit's played of late um, outside of their record and the way Green Bay is climbing the ladder, they look a lot better.